Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'd like to talk to you about evidence for evolution. Sure, we have evidence from organisms that have lived a long time ago, the fossil record, but if evolution is occurring, and, and it is, we should have evidence not only from organisms of the past, but we should have evidence from the current organisms that are living today. And we do. We have all sorts of evidence from bone comparisons to protein comparisons and even most recently DNA comparisons. So I want to talk to you today about all the, the, the myriad of evidence that we have suggesting that evolution is taking place both the past and the present. So let's jump right into that conversation. And so fossil record, very compelling. It, it's what led early scientists to believe in evolution in the first place. Believe isn't really the right word, but sort of to verify that change was occurring. And Charles Darwin used the evidence of fossils to support his case that organisms have, have been changing. So let's talk about fossils. Fossils, you know, they're pretty cool if you've ever seen one in person. Like bones, like People love these, like big giant dinosaur bones and shell, sea fit, shells from the past, all kinds of cool things. But so they're preserved remnants. In other words, things that haven't decomposed um, from organisms that have lived in the past. And so if you wanted to find like uh, an archaeological dig and, and, you, and you found old pairs of glasses or, or tools, that isn't per se a fossil. But we're talking about like actual living remains like in other words bones and teeth and things like that. And so what's interesting is the fossil record is sort of an ordered array. And what I mean by that is that it appears in a sequential pattern with the oldest fossils on the bottom and the newer ones today. And so there's a succession of types that are found in the in sort of geological time and you can sort of look at that. And one of the richest sources of where you can find fossils, what type of rock houses the best fossils, of course it's going to be sedimentary rock. Sediments that are that come in from lakes and such <clears throat> little particles will eventually go to the bottom when organisms die. Even on the land they're sort of brought into the water and then they're stacked layer and layer and layer. And so these ones on the very bottom are the oldest and the, and the, the ones on the top are the youngest. And so you can look at that. But when you look at that, that's relative age. If you really wanted to know like the absolute age, you could something you could use radioactive dating and we're going to talk about that. Here's a cool picture of actual sedimentary rock right here. You can see the strata. These are the layers that have sediment and through pressure and heat that sediment has been compressed into rock. And so it's a type of rock called sedimentary rock. But you know the truth is we don't find fossils, so many fossils, because what happens is when you die, you decompose. So, so this, you know, the soft parts like muscle and, and other soft tissue are decomposed by bacteria and fungi. But so the parts that we find are often like the hard parts. Like for example, look at that. Can you tell what that is? It's a big tooth. Look at that. Even part of the gum. Almost the size of this person's hand. So this is a huge dinosaur. I'm not sure what it is, but it's a big tooth. Kind of if this is the tooth, I would hate to be chased down by that dinosaur. So this is great when you can find these things. Um, we found whole skeletons. You've probably seen them in museums. Um, but it's usually the hard parts, the teeth, the uh, bones, that sort of thing. But you, you can get lucky and find all sorts of weird things. Like, for example, look at this person standing in what appears to be like a little hole. What this is are actually fossilized footprints of a dinosaur that was walking in this area. And you can sort of tell with, with really cool analysis how fast the dinosaur was, was capable of moving. Uh, you can even tell by, by measuring the depth and pressure of, uh, in this area, the weight and of, the, of the animal. And you can also look at sort of a little bit about um, they were leaning forward or back. It's a, it's a remarkable sort of like a crime scene. It's, re it's remarkable what scientists are able to sort of uncover based on uh, same, something that's sort of obscure, like just, you know, footprints. <laughs> so dinosaur tracks provide evidence about how fast they were going. And then I find this to be most remarkable, like check this out. 
So scientists uncover fossil over here in the east side of South America and over here on the western side of Africa. And as it turns out that it's beyond a coincidence that this skeleton and this skeleton are very, very similar. It's the same species. And now we've even gone as far as you can scrape the bone and actually sequence the DNA. And these were identical. It's like, how in the world, like obviously this is not a swimming organism, how can they have traveled that far? They didn't travel that far. Once upon a time, long time ago, the green area was once one. Do you notice here how the continents are kind of like a puzzle piece? Like this part fits over here and this part fits over here. I don't know if you knew this, but we believe that all of the continents were once one many millions of years ago in a, in a supercontinent called Pangaea. This is evidence of that. So this is cool evidence that the Earth has been changing through uh, plate tectonics. Now, if an organism were to die in, in sort of a weird place, like, for example, a woolly mammoth were, the, were to die in the snow, you know, like, ice is a, is a great preservative. We put our food in their freezer and it sort of slows down bacteria decomposition. And so we found all-out organisms that have been frozen in time. We've, we, you can even find insects and such that have been preserved in what's called amber. It's sort of this very sugary, hardened rock, sort of like rock candy. It's sort of the phloem sap of ancient trees that have been petrified. You can even find them in acid bogs, which are sort of swampy areas with a very low pH, which slows down decomposition. You can even find them in tar pits, like down in Los Angeles, the La Brea tar pits. So you can find the whole body if you're lucky, but it's usually rare. You usually find like teeth. And again, you can look at the strata, in other words, the layers of sedimentary rock, and say, hey, there's a fossil there, which is much older than this one, which is older than this one, and then the youngest ones are on the top. And so you can look at that. <clears throat> and so we can actually date the rock. You take a sample of the rock, and with the fossil in it, like if there's a little bone right in that area or a little tooth in that area, you can send it to the chem lab. And what's interesting is they can use radioactive dating in order to detect how old the, the fossil is. Radioactivity, very briefly, is something really cool. It's when, if you remember, when the nucleus of an atom begins to break down. And it's a constant breakdown. In other words, the rate of decay or, or breaking down is constant. And so what's interesting is some elements on the periodic table, there's different isotopes. Isotopes are the same element, but varying numbers of neutrons. And as it turns out, some of those isotopes are radioactive, which means they decay. And so one of the most common radioactive isotopes that we like to work with in biology is carbon. And the radioactive carbon is carbon-12, but there's carbon, I'm sorry, car carbon-14 is radioactive, and we can put in little asterisks for radioactive, meaning that it declines or breaks down. Uh, we have carbon-12, carbon-14, there's, there's a few others as well. We like to use carbon because carbon's found in all living things. If you remember, carbon enters the ecosystem via plants, and also bacteria that photosynthesize, because plants pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And as it turns out, some of the carbon dioxide in the air is C12 and some C14. And so there's like a ratio of C12 and C14 in the atmosphere. And what's fascinating is that ratio has been consistent for millions and millions of years. We know that because we can actually pull out icicles from from the Antarctica and, and Arctic regions and actually uh, melt the, the ice and actually determine the dissolved carbon dioxide and, and look at those ratios and they've been consistent. What's interesting about it is, so a plant takes in some 12, some 14, and then it turns it into sugar, as you may know. So that's uh, CH2O. And so this is going to have some 12 and some 14 in it. And basically, how do you like this? Whoops. Every organic molecule in the plant primarily sugars, but proteins as well have that same ratio. And what's interesting about that is that when an herbivore comes along, in other words, something that eats a plant, it's going to eat it 
in the same ratio as it is in the plant, obviously, which is the same ratio as it is in the atmosphere. So all animals, how about this, the whole food chain, how about every living thing on the earth has the exact same 12 to 14 carbon ratio in their body when they're alive? Just wanted to point that out. And so, you know, what's my point? Well, the point is that when you're living, you can you eat. And when you're living, you if you're a plant, you breathe in carbon dioxide. And it's the same proportions, same ratio as it, as it is in the atmosphere. But C14 goes down, as I was mentioning. And you're like, yeah, I know you said that, but what does it mean? That means that when it gives up, when its nucleus gives up a proton, eventually the proton's going to dis disintegrate. There's different types of radioactivity. I won't mention all the different kinds. But it basically breaks up, and it will decay into something called nitrogen, nitrogen-14. Yeah, and so when it breaks up, as it turns out, that the amount of carbon-14 in a bone decreases over time because it's no longer eating. The carbon-12 remains the same. So 14 goes away over a period of time. I hope that's, I hope that's clear. And so as it turns out, when the, when the organism dies and it's a bone, the 14 starts to slowly disappear. So when you bring your bone into the chem lab and you analyze how much carbon-14 there is, there's going to be less than what it had when it was alive. And you're like, okay, that's great, but if it's a bone from a dinosaur millions of years ago, how do I know how much it had originally? If you say that it's been declining, I, I, you know, whatever, but I don't know how much the dinosaur bone had originally. Well, you do know because the 12 stays the same. And if the 12 stays the same, that means the 14 should have had a, the same ratio, but no, it, it has less because it's been declining. So what you do is, if you looked at a bone like this, and let me just get make the numbers very easy. If a living organism, so just freshly dead, has two grams of carbon-14, so this is when it was alive, so living, and then you find it, like in the, down here in the strata, and it's, and it's a long time has gone by. And so you send it into the chem lab, and you're like, hey, how much carbon-14? You're like, um, there's only 0.5 grams, 0 0.5 grams. And you're like, okay, it's been, it's been decaying. How old is it? Well, you ready for this? We know that the rate of decay is constant. So you ready for this? You're going to love this. So when half of it is gone, from when we go from two, this is when it was alive, to one, when half of it, you're like, well, how long is that? It takes 5,730 years for half of the substance to decay. That's called the isotope's half-life. You're like, how do we know that? No one's been studying it for 5,000. Well, if I were to tap, 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 tap. In other words, if I keep my the, the tempo the same, the tapping, you'd be able to tell me how many times I tap in a year. In other words, you'd count the number of taps per minute and then per hour and then per day and then multiply it up. So we know that the half-life is 5,730. So you ready for this? Then what's another half-life? What's half of 1.5? So that's two half-lives. So guess how old the bone is? It's 5,730 plus 5,730 or multiplied by 2. So the fossil is 11,460. Now I gave it nice numbers like this, but I think you get the point. The chemistry lab can tell you how old the fossil is. So that's evidence from the past. But what, what evidence do we have today that evolution has been going on? if I might say, the most compelling evidence of all. There's all kinds of evidence that, that is um, present in biology, and I'm just going to cut right to the chase. The most compelling evidence is of all that life descended from a common ancestor and that all living things are related to one another is the powerful evidence that we have from molecular biology. So in other words, our modern technology. This is a picture you might recognize it of a thermal cycler. 
We use this in the lab, as you may recall. You can take small samples of DNA and make many copies. It's DNA replication in a, in a tube. Why would you want many copies of DNA? Well, there's small amounts of DNA in fossils, and so you can make many copies of it and then sequence it. And if you compare those sequences of DNA, you'll find how similar organisms really are to one another. So it's very compelling. But before we, before we discovered DNA and, and before we even started sequencing DNA, biologists were starting to notice similarities between organisms. Like even on the outward, like for example, did you know that like a bird's wing and a, say a dolphin's fin and a human arm, did you know that we had the same bone structure inside? So in other words, um, when new species are, are coming into place in the world, it isn't like these features are, are needing to start from new. They're basically the same old bones that have been modified through natural selection over time. And so they're sort of the altered versions of the ancestral species. This is the humerus, this is the humerus, this is your the radius, which is, which is here in yellow, and the ulna. And these are the two bones here. These little rocky kind of bones are called your carpals. These are the metacarpals and then phalanges. Look how similar they are. So this is an example of what we call homology. So similar characteristics, uh, which can be thought of as a common ancestry. Look at this. Bats have the same bone structure as a whale, as a cat, as a human. Isn't that interesting? There's slight differences. And again, Look how long the phalanges are. And again, they don't get longer um, from use or disuse, but maybe there's an advantage to having a long phalange in order to provide structure for the, for the whale to, to move along. And same in the bat. It extends into the wing. It's interesting. And so this is a, homology is similar structures, and it's evidence that ancestral species are very similar to one another. And again, the fact that the forelimbs of, this is what a forelimb is, is a human, a cat, and a whale, they may look different from the outside, but the skeletons are the same, which is evidence that all these organisms diverged from a common ancestral tetrapod, meaning a four-legged or four-foot forelimb. So these are just the offshoots of that. Hom these are known as homolo homologous structures, so same structures, homology. Uh, you can even look at comparative anatomy, same sort of thing. The femur of a human is this very similar to the femur, femur of a frog. And then you can also sort of look at sort of um, circumstantial sorts of evidence. Like, for example, geez, humans have a lot of knee problems from running and walking around. There's a lot of people, orthopedic surgeons can tell you that people suffer from a lot of problems with their meniscus and their articular car cartilage. Why so much suffering? As it turns out, that the knee isn't perfectly designed. It's basically the same old knee that when our ancestors were walking around on four legs. And so now that we're bipedal, just two feet, uh, walking around and running, it puts a lot of strain on the bone and there's a lot of knee problems that are associated with that. So one of the most interesting examples of homologous structures of them all are homologous structures that don't do anything. They're these structures in an organisms that have no use at all. They're called vestigial organs. And what's fascinating is, look, this is a snake. And the snake has pelvic bones. This is a remnant of when its ancestors used to walk around. And this is a whale. This is a marine mammal that's in the ocean with pelvic bones. They, they don't do anything. They're rather small. But it's not small from disuse, but rather Perhaps there was a reason that if they were larger, it may have affected the whale's ability to swim. So vestigial organs, and we have an appendix today that's a vestigial organ. And then other evidence from living things is the fact that when you look at, look at this, if I were to cover this up, would you even be able to tell the difference between a fish and a human embryo, or a chicken embryo and a rabbit embryo? But then as they develop, you could start to see how they're sort of differentiating but the fact that we have a common embryonic development at, at different stages, at first week, second week, third week, is evidence that 
we have a common that we all have a common ancestry that we're all very much related and even when you look at the adult structures and say look at the gills of a fish and this eustachian tube which connects the the uh, inner the middle ear with the uh, the mouth these tubes look completely different but early on in embryology they're very similar but the most compelling evidence of all and I mentioned this right at the start of the video is now that we're able to pull DNA from plants and animals and from pigs, like we're able to pull it out of a redwood tree, as you may know, we can compare the DNA sequences of, of trees with people or people with frogs and frogs with goats, and we can see they're not exactly the same, but they're very, very similar. So if you can compare bones between a whale and a person, why couldn't you compare protein? Like, does a whale... Does a whale have the same hemoglobin as a human? Does a horse have the same hemoglobin protein? We can look at those amino acid sequences. And then ultimately, we could look at the gene, nitrogen-based sequences, and make those comparisons. And that's what we are doing. Because today, we, ha we know that all living things share the same genetic machinery, the same RNA, messenger RNA sequences, the same DNA. The genetic code is essentially universal amongst all living things. What does that tell you? That tell, If Charles Darwin knew that, his, his life dream would have been fulfilled. This is the most compelling evidence that all living things on the earth have descended from a common ancestor, is that we have the very similar DNA sequences. And so this homology that we see in bone structure, uh, it can be also found in protein amino acid sequence and nitrogen based sequences so we can compare um, comparative anatomy and we can also look at proteins and let me give you an example of this so one of the most important proteins that we have in our body is this I mentioned before is this um, four chain uh, polypeptide called hemoglobin it's found in red blood cells and helps us carry oxygen in the body if we were able to compare how many amino acid differences do we have with, say, a rhesus monkey? In just one of the four chains, there's 146 amino acids in one of the chains. There's only eight different amino acids. That's pretty similar for us in a rhesus monkey. You're like, well, what? And then there's 27 between us and a mouse, and 45 in the chicken, and 67 in a frog, and so on. What, what does this tell me? This tells me we're pretty similar to the rhesus monkey, a little bit less similar to the mouse. So this is a little bit further back in the tree. Like if you think of this as a tree and say, well, humans are, can see here's the tree here in yellow. And these are the branches. We're pretty similar to a, like a macaw over here. And then we're a little bit less similar to the dog, a little bit less similar to a bird, a little less similar to a frog. And so we can use amino acid differences to sort of develop what's known as an evolutionary tree. And so that's very strong, compelling evidence. And then, you know, going, bringing it all the way back to the Galapagos and the and Charles Darwin is Darwin knew that islands like an archipelago, like a chain of volcanic islands, they really were, were calling out evidence for evolution because there's endemics that live there, the marine iguana, all these different 13 species of finch on the Galapagos Islands, this weird flightless cormorant, these weird male um, frigate birds with their big red pouches. All of these animals and all odd organisms, they're found nowhere else in the world. So they had to have immigrated there and then changed. So endemics are great evidence for evolutionary change. The fact that there's all these different beak structures on the different islands showing a, a tremendous diversification on the Galapagos Islands was one of the very first forms of evidence. And we see that today because these birds are still alive. So finally, natural selection, the mechanism of evolutionary change, is widely accepted in science. It is the bedrock of biology. And why? Because all the facts accumulate. It's withstood countless evidence and observations. And all these facts point to one escapable truth, which is the theory of natural selection. And so science isn't static. It doesn't, 
to scale. Okay, we're completely confident. It continues to look and further investigates these matters. And so the study of evolution is more lively than ever. But the questions about how life evolved um, don't imply that we consider it just a theory. It is a theory because it's built on fact. And so Charles Darwin, again, sitting here, look how content he is. Uh, by attributing the diversity of, of life to the natural causes rather than supernatural, um, he gave biology a sound scientific basis. Um, endless forms, most beautiful. Um, and there's grandeur in this view of life. And I, I hope you appreciate that. So much evidence for evolution. Um, I think it's important. You're like, well, why, what, give it to me right now in a sentence. Why is it important to even know that there's ev evidence of evolution? Because there's grandeur this way. Doesn't that, doesn't that, isn't it heartwarming to know that every living creature on the earth is related to you? It should. Not only are all people very closely related, but all living things. So every life is precious and it needs to be conserved. We, have, we, need, to, we need to believe that. And indeed, that's a religion in a, even, even in its own right. So I hope you enjoyed watching this video on evidence of evolution. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks.